This is the high school. This is the high school I went to. Dave went to it. Prince Paul went to it. Haas went to it. Mace went to it. So, you know, this is the high school, you know, I was going, banging on, a, banging on the table, making beats, you know, doing all that good stuff. Yo, this is like, you know, the school where a lot of stuff happens. A lot of great talents came out of it, and this is why y'all hear the music that, this is our influence of the music and how it sounds. This is where it all starts, yo. <laughs> So, fellas, tell us a little bit about yourselves. President. President preaching about the on tech, known for the new step, stop and take a bow. Amityville, resident. Resident supported by the speaker view. Wanna feel it in your shoe? Let me show you how. I was in 12th. Dave was in 11th. Poss was in 10th and Mace was in ninth. I'm a nerd, and I, and I get that, and I, and I accept that, but I was like, these guys are really nerdy. Probably with the exception of Mace. Mace was always like the I'll beat you up type kind of guy. Real nice, but you don't mess with him. But those guys kind of seeing him, I was like, man, they're like ultra nerdy like me, and you, you rhyme? I told them what I can do and, and what I thought of them and how we could work together. It, it was perfect. It's like an act of God, almost. Like, we were meant to be in the same place at the same time with the same thoughts. How do these guys come together in a place like Amityville, Long Island, to make this record? You know what I'm saying? With my weird personality and their quirkiness, how do, how do we come together? Like, it's just, I, I, it's, it's indescribable to me. Like, I, it, it freaks me out sometimes, but I really put some thought into it. If you have a creative mind, you can basically use anything. For example, I could take a record such as a basic Disneyland Mickey Mouse record, for example. Now, people may not believe it, but if you look through these old records, you could find things like drum beats on them. It's hard to believe, though. Paul was just a, a really dope DJ from the neighborhood and well-respected and, and actually re really appreciated and loved. He was just a really kind dude who just loved hip-hop and had great skills. So once he, as a Long Island guy out of Amityville gets connected with these Brooklyn guys called Stetson Sonic. It just put that much more fire amongst everyone in the neighborhood. Like, wow, Paul made it. Outside of just knowing Paul and seeing him do parties, it was really Mace who linked with him because Mace as well was just DJ. Yeah, Paul and I, we had a natural uh, progression <clears throat> behind DJing around the neighborhood. And I always told him I had some stuff I'd like for him to hear. Everybody used to bombard him with that. One day he came up to the school, got me, we went to my house, got these tapes, and I played him the stuff, and he was like, yo, I need to have a meeting with y'all. He said, I can't make any promises, but we'll take this to the studio, and we'll clean all of this up. A lot of stuff what you would hear is probably the main, because we had what we call main loop, this loop, that loop, that loop, would probably be the main loop. So they, whatever you, we would hear in the demos was always like the main thing. And my thing was like, yo, I can really make this sexy. And, and that's, and they respected that. And, it, and you could hear the difference. Plug one, plug two, plug one, plug two, plug one, plug two, plug one. I first heard of De La Soul when I got a call from daddy -o from Stetsasonic, and he told me that Prince Paul, who was working with this group called De La Soul, he said, you know, it's kind of ill, it's kind of different sounding, da da da. I'm like, well, bring it in, I want to hear it. Sure enough, he brought me plug tune in and freedom of speak. First of all, I was like, this sounds like it was mixed with like sand and dirt. It was like so dusted sounding and it was so different. When I heard De La Soul the first time, I remember saying, you know, this is gonna do nothing or it's gonna be really big. Cause when you listen to it, it was so bizarre compared to anything out. 
And whether it did something or didn't do something, we loved it and we, we thought it was important that it came out. I thought they were pretty fantastic. And I had a meeting with them. They came in, they said, like, well, my name's Pastanus, which is sop sound backwards. Pastanus. Pas is backwards for sop, and denus is backwards for sound. Sop, sound. My name is Trugoy, which is yogurt spelled backwards. Trugoy the dove. Trugoy is yogurt backwards. And then Macia, which sound, it was the most normal, the bunch of them. And Mace actually means making a soul effort. And they had, you know, these unusual haircuts, and their style was completely antithetical to the uh, prevailing aesthetic of hip hop at the time, which was much more driven by uh, black leather and gold chains and such. They were definitely like these introverted, nerdy guys that were very cool. pretty early on that this was a group that was album bound. I had uh, hired a young gun a and guy. His name is Dante Ross. I think the first project I may have assigned him was working with De La Soul. Well, one, I was broke. Two, I was hungry. Three, I was two steps out of like the streets. So I was a pretty wild kid back then. My daily routine was I usually came in hungover. Uh, bearing a firearm and probably sold some weed to a couple of people during the day out of my office, which was a converted mail room. I didn't have a stereo, I had a boom box. That's what I listened to everything on. Between selling weed and trying to follow up on all the girls I tried to kick it to the night before when I was drunk, I listened to some demos and, and producers came and saw me and et cetera, et cetera. Then the other thing was that De La, um, Monica Lynch played it for me when she was interviewing me for the job and said, we're thinking about signing this. And I said, that's great, you should sign that. And uh, the rest is history. She signed it and I got the job and she said, here's your first project. I just like things that aren't normal. I like shit to the left of everything. I don't like normal rap. I like something that stands out, that's just different. That itself doesn't have to try and have like a fake image, something that comes from my heart. Hello, Prince Paul's the name. You know the DJ for Sets of Sonic and the producer of this particular group? And now off of that and on to the soul. They lie, that is. If you take three glasses of water and put food coloring in them, you have many different colors, but it's still the same old water. Make the connection, and now back to our video. You know, Three Feet High and Rising kind of was a stage for us being kids, having a good time out of high school, being jerks, being, being silly. Even with Paul being involved, like, he could lend to the zaniness, and he can also help tap into your strengths and allow you not to be afraid, especially in those early albums, to, to use them. I mean, like, even Dave. Dave has always been so creative, and sometimes he would be like, but eh, I don't know about this, but Paul would be like, no, no, do it. Look, I, I, I push for creativity and to everybody to be involved, and I think a lot of it had to do with me being with, with Sets of Sonic. I remember feeling somewhat limited, like, one, because I was the youngest in the group. So it was like, hey, I want to, hey, I want to. So it's almost like when you get older and you say, when I have my family, we're going to go to eat ice cream for dinner. And we're going to do and I'm going to break all these rules. And that's where that was the release for Daylight for me, was all the things I couldn't do in Sets of Sonic, I'm going to allow these guys to do. And in the process of me doing this, I'm going to teach them what I know. He would make me sit at the board and mix. Like, Mace, touch the buttons, man. A mentor I had prior to him would never let me touch the board. And he saw that, because we worked with the same person. And he was like, man, I was like, yo, they don't let me touch anything in the studio. You know what I mean? He was like, touch it, man. He's like, look at each channel on that board like uh, your radio station in your car. He gave me that simplistic outlook of wow. each channel on the board. He said, obviously, there's more stuff, but start right here. First, you get your record. Your red groove or whatever sound that you choose to sample, just, you know, try not to sample nothing that's gonna get you sued. Just get your level. Sample is caught. Go to edit sample. 
and proceed to edit your sample to where you want to start it at. And there you have it. Quelle heure? Quelle heure est-il? When Tommy Boy had Planet Rock, we got sued by Kraftwerk for uh, a publishing sample on that. And I sort of overreacted and I hired, like my, the third employee was a lawyer to protect me and to, so that we would always be able to clear samples. And we asked the uh, producers to tell us what samples were on there and the artists, and normally they did. Uh, with the with Three Feet High and Rising, they forgot, they didn't tell us one because, you know, they have a lot of those little, what they call bug out pieces, little interstitial uh, skits. There was a, a tiny little, tiny little sample that was slowed down from 45 to 33, and it was the Turtles from You Showed Me. And we got sued by them, it was $100,000 for that little bit, which we would have just left it off if we had known, but we didn't even know that was on there, and they figured nobody would care. It is still infringement as far as we're concerned and they have violated our exclusive rights in the sound recording. Greetings, girl, and welcome to my world of phrasing right up to back. It's the daisy age, you're about to walk top stage, so wipe your lottoes on the mat. They came out brand new, slam, and everybody accepted them, you know? So I think they're gonna, you know, start a new trend, and they're gonna be around for a while. This is the type of contemporary sound that we need today. It ain't the same old, same old, like all the stories so. And believe that, they lost so, yo, your niggas got complete mic control. I saw that it spoke to lots of different people. Right, right away I saw that. My friends from downtown loved him. But then the hood guys like him. We just shows up in the Bronx, it's gay key and shit like that. We did Irving Plaza, Payday and all the, everyone loved, that was their first show they ever did. Yeah, and they had the girls with the cue cards and the baskets and their boy Granny who danced and everyone loved them. DMC was there and he was telling them how great they were and they should go on again. And they said, we only got two songs, we can't go on again. And Fat Five Freddy was there and Corey Robbins, but then all my downtown friends were there too. And they were like, yo, they're amazing. Like, that's the best shit ever. And, and I realized that I was onto something, that, that something was happening. It's one of the few times in my life I realized I was in the middle of something that potentially was great. You could tell these three guys were really ghetto, but they definitely were hip and they had a, an interesting style. And there was an intelligence that you could just kind of sense. I have to say, in New York, people caught on to it pretty quickly because it was cool and different. And it started bubbling up from the clubs pretty quickly. And Red Alert and Magic and the other key DJs on the radio. Red Alert was known for breaking records. There were there was lots of records I identify as Red Alert records. And uh, he was the DJ at the Quarters on Friday night. And the Latin Quarters was a. Uh, a mythical place. It was it was hyper violent and dangerous. And I had the honor of taking that record because they knew I knew Red, and I hit Red with the record, and Red played it right away. Crown Latin Quarters was like they would let you know what they believe in, what they feel for. They looked up to me, you know, because the roof was up top, and they turned around, look at me, and like, yo, and I just kept on playing. Are you the new hippies? Um, we don't mind when people say that we're hippies. We just don't appreciate when people claim that we're trying to do it just to sell records and just to get people interested. You know, everything we do is made up out of our personalities. So if our sound has a hippie-like sound, then I guess that's what it has. But do you feel a hippie yourself? You're wearing a peace sign. Yeah, I'm wearing a peace sign, but that doesn't represent the fact that I'm being a hippie. I mean, everyone wants peace and harmony in the world, so I guess that's why we... We deal with the peace sign. I think people expected De La Soul to be these loving flower power soul children. And there was a lot of testing happening on the road. People, you know, thinking that, you know, we could step on these little guys, these kids. And even to the extent of like, even sometimes it felt like that with management, tour, labels. They want to test them Long Island kids who, who had yeah, flowers in their pictures. I boxed a little bit. People didn't know that. Mm -mm. You know, people who can fight don't talk about fighting. Yeah, for real. They would definitely go and knuckle up, you know, if people tried to test them, particularly Mace. They were young black men, and they had to deal with all the things that come with being a young black man, and they were being marketed in a way that they felt, I think, was emasculating, in a sense, and, and led them 
to be stereotyped in a way that would, that could potentially question their blackness. Random people would come up to me and like, yo, you know, your boy's out on the road. I heard they beat up such and such. I'm like, what? And they shot up a car. And they, like, I'd hear all these different stories that people would come up because they knew I, you know, obviously I work with them. And I'm like, what? That's crazy. And I would ask them. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's true. I like to call them the hippies of hip hop. I think for me, it was it was just the photo shoots. I mean, every damn photo shoot, you could bet there was a florist hanging around with flowers. I mean, and it was just like, come on, man. Like, flowers, that's not what it's really about. I can understand what it stands for. I can understand the connection and everything. But like, you know, we're beyond that. We're really doing this seriously because we love the music. And that's, that's what got horrible. Like, seeing them damn daisies everywhere we went. The in a sound y'all, and that's Daisy. D A would be said like the. I is inner, S is sound, and Y is y'all. So, I mean, showing daisies with just a visual um, thing as far as the word Daisy itself, it's, it really had nothing to do with being hippies in the 60s and stuff. blown up with three feet high and rising. For them, whether it was on the road or dealing with other people, you know, they kind of got pushed back and understandably decided to make a huge statement about it and say, De La Soul is dead. I was really disappointed. Honestly, I was really disappointed because uh, I didn't think they should be apologizing for who they were and what they were saying. This was the time when hip hop went really hardcore. And it was cool to be a gangster. And Dale was anything but a gangster. They're from Long Island. Nobody ever thought they were a gangster. No one really cared about that. Really to say Dale Soul is dead really was a reaction. They wanted to bury that image that, that they had built and was working for them. And I thought it was unfortunate, you know, because I mean, Dale Soul is dead is, was a good record. There was a few records in there that were apologetic. And I don't really think an artist should ever have to apologize. Yo, 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 like, you can't say that. You can't say De La Soul is dead. dead. Yeah, like, that was a big thing. That, yeah, yeah. you know, like, saying that. This, just saying that is like planting the seed that you're dead. Like, you're not worth <laughs> what you are. And we was having a good time joking around and sticking to our stupidity. De La Soul is dead was a joke. As they were saying, the title just came from us being up at our management, Rush Management at the time, and they would have this board with all the different groups on the board and showing where each group was going, where they had to appear. And Dave just walked up to the, to the, you know, the board and took the little eraser and raced <laughs> all of our dates off and wrote, De La Soul is dead. And then we all started dying laughing. You know, like, cause he was just tired of like, yo, I want to stay home. I don't want to go out on the road. I want, so, but that and that, in that very moment, we would, it resonated with us like, yo, this could be a dope album title. And then this all started from there. Back once more with the wall up in the score. Spice about a riff shit to make it rock your hip. Revival of the roller boogie and a rick shit to make you think about the time we spoke fun instead of De La Soul is Dead basically captured our experience in the industry. Being on tour, having this regiment and the schedule and frustration as well. So when you listen to the second record, it's a little bitter in a lot of ways, especially if you compare it to the first one, you know, because they, they live life now. You gotta understand, like, you know, we had the first single, the second single, all of a sudden it's like, bam! Like, things just went full steam ahead, and me on the outside looking in, they weren't really prepared for that. I mean, we'd go down the street and kids were like, ah! Oh! We'd chase them, they would have to run to the stores. You know, people making promises, you know, music industry people, hey, how you doing? The record's not doing good, hey, you know, I'm not messing with you. So they got to see a lot of things you know, a lot of phoniness, a lot of stuff like that. So it made them a little kind of like, mm. They smartly said, reset. <laughs> Boom. And they continued to make amazing music. Mercy. Mercy. Ego trip. Ego trip. Mercy. Ego trip. Ego trip. Mercy. Ah! I got the joint to make you jump. Yeah.
hip hop was starting to become materialistic. Puffy changed the structure of hip hop was the culture of hip hop. He, he made the hip hop more flashy. He made hip hop a shiny suit to put on. Where before that it was come as you are. I don't care you got holes in your pants or holes in your sneakers, we'll take you like that. Yo, what whether it was Puff, whether it was whoever, what y'all doing is dope. But don't act like you're the most amazing producer because you're looping up something because it's too easy to do. For those who, who are really doing it, we're really doing it, you know? For the ones that were trying to follow a trend because of the person who's really doing it, you know, they're thinking that's how they got to do it to now be a part of what they think the people want to see and hear. And some people got offended, but respected it at the same time. We don't really say too much about it, but you know, we monitor everybody out there who is basically getting on that level of, I guess, becoming a rapper. Whether you become an actor or whatever, you know, you can't lose grounds with that. You know, that's something that Daylight has never done. We never really lost grounds with the people who we feel are equal and we are equal to everybody else. You know, saying there's no status, no nothing like that, no ego trip and nothing like that. But, um, you know, some people lose it and it's misfortunate, but in time, somebody will bring them down a level. We really didn't even know where we stood in the industry. You know, we had just came out of making this album that I will say, which is Balloon Mind State, which funny enough has become an album that a lot of people will come up to us today and be like, when y'all put that out then, I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't know what y'all was talking about. And now as I've gotten and grown up, this has become one of my favorite albums. So then to have, you know, Tribe put out this phenomenal album, Wu-Tang come out big, everyone, and then and we had this really jazzy album that stood on its own. Going into the touring of that album and being on tour with Tribe and Lior's backstage while Tribe's on ripping it, and he's saying like, hey, tighten your belts, fellas, because this album didn't do shit. About to get rough. It's about, 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 to, about get to get rough. rough for you guys. You know, and it was, you know, God bless the dead. Dave's cousin was like, yeah, man, like, your stakes is high for y'all. Like, that album, obviously became the first album where the title was there before we started recording. Stakes is high, literally what the name of the album is, was, yo, this is our last go around. If we don't make this happen, this is it for us. So there was a lot of pressure on them. You want to do you, but then again, now you, you, you don't want to get lost. And my thing was always like, us being us got us here. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and so don't stress it. Let's just always do us and we'll be fine. Like, we started working on Stakes is High together in my house. They might tell you different, but I remember we was in my house, and uh, I could tell you the story clearly. We was listening to it. It was a hi-hat on one of the songs. You know, I had, you know, computer and ADAT set up in my house. And it was a little off, but it was funky. You know, I was like, it, it's fun with the track. And me, I'm always like, if it feels right, it's right. It, you know, and, you know, I remember debating, no, it needs to be more on, you know, on the grid and blah, 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 tap, tap. I was like, no, but it works. So we're debating on little things now. Me being a little, I wouldn't say stubborn, but kind of like, you know, maybe we should end this now because we're still friends. Because if we continue to work, we're not going to see eye to eye. Now, it was a tough, tough moment for me, man. It was like, my identity is with De La Soul. My beginnings are with Stetson Sonic, but my identity has always been with De La Soul. So it was a tough decision for me to say, Yo, F it. One of those amazing qualities that Paul brings is the zaniness. And this was the first album where we knew that the title was called Stakes is High. This was going to be pretty much our Marvin Gaye, What's Going On. It wasn't no time for zaniness. And so we were coming across, like, creatively, like, mm, nah, that's not going to work. As immature and as childish as I acted, I was very aware of the value of friendships, you know what I'm saying, and art. You know, I'm always art first. So I, how can I argue with these guys about a hi-hat and all this other stuff, but not let them express themselves? You know, it's going against art, arts for art's sake. You know, so, you know, it's what you want to do. I'm not going to step on your toes. Rap in the 90s. It's creative, it's candid, it's controversial. But how much does the music dictate real life? And how much does real life dictate the music? Today on the show, we have rappers De La Soul to discuss the many ways. Keep it real. This album had a lot more boom back to it. They started to work with Jay Dilla, uh, rest in peace. Haas would talk about Jay all the time to me, and he put a lot of people on to his production. 
production, the records they're sampling, choruses, the melodicness, Dave sings a lot on it. Dead Common was on the track, Most Def was on the track. I can never ever say I discovered Most Def. I think Most Def revealed himself to me. Well, he was already studying music theory and all that, and the acting was happening for him since he was a child, and he could have totally gone that way. We came along and was kind of, he felt like we was life changing for him, especially growing up in Brooklyn and being different. Most will say that to this day. He wasn't fucking with hip hop until he fucked with Daylock. I love that album. Like, I wish my son was here because he was a baby, like, I don't know, maybe like four years old back then, but we used to listen to that record nonstop. Ironically, right, it should be the record, like, oh, these guys, oh, but it's like probably my favorite Daylight record out of all the records. Stated by, yeah, by the brand. I think that, you know, throughout their career, and we're sitting here in 2016, they've had to make a lot of decisions, artistic decisions, commercial decisions, big career decisions. I mean, I just, I can't, I, I don't want to say I can't believe, but I'm like astounded by just everything that they've accomplished in 27 years. I think a lot of acts look at De La Soul and say, how can I do that? Their fan base is a fan base that grew with them and stayed with them to tour the world without a record. And they've been doing this for, what, 25 years straight? The only reason they have it like that, I feel, is because they stay true to themselves. New album is entitled And the Anonymous Nobody. I mean, this record was definitely not the norm for us. And the worst thing would have been having a corporation, uh, an executive over our heads, you know, policing everything we did. I mean, we have songs on this album that are five minutes long, and there's no lyrics or rhymes until the last 40 seconds. So we needed freedom to release a record that was just totally the way we wanted it to be. So we tried the Kickstarter. You know, we thought, okay, let's, let's see if our fans would be gracious enough to support and believe in our project. It didn't matter if we just reached our goal, 110,000, what we were shooting for, or, or landed where we, where we obviously landed at 600,000 and change. Uh, it was just good seeing every day somebody coming in and saying, I believe in this. I mean, of course, overwhelming that we raised that type of money and had so much cash to work with to record this record. But at the end of the day, those 11,000 people are like, they saved our lives. You know, they, they, they kind of like gave us this boost in confidence to say, yeah, you know, you guys are still wanted out there. You still can do this. I think the staying power just attests to how great it is. You, you know what I'm saying? And the, yo, come on, they crowdsourced over a half million dollars. They're touring the world. They've got a great new album coming out. Critics be damned. I donated. Did you? <laughs> of course. Wow, okay. I'm a fan still, you know? If there were no De La Soul, there would be no Kendrick. De La Soul always pushed the button before it was time to push it. I mean, De La Soul to me is you know, probably the greatest rap group of all time. She had me in Starbucks, sipping Frappuccino. I want to grind on that coffee bean. A couple of cups of that Joe is a bad pep. She'll be swinging on chandeliers.